right, so we are live and I think there's a number of participants basically what happens is they go from like a waiting room to the room. So good evening, everybody. We have people logging on, coming back over. I just wanted to make sure if you guys can find the chat and um, it looks like they're still building back up. If you guys can hear me, then you can put yes in the chat. As we're getting ready in these last couple seconds, it usually takes a minute for, for people to come over. Yes, so thanks Jacqueline, thanks Lisa, great. So good, that's always like, phew. I feel like once that happens, <laughs> we're good to go. The rest of it's the, the easy part, so thank you for responding. Um, and I would just have a couple minutes still, and I know there was over 100 people that registered, I know that you know, usually dinner time and stuff, we, we definitely lose people. So we're just gonna give it just another minute. And then Michelle, if you wanted to take it, oh, it's like 6.30. So um, maybe one more minute as people are logging on and then we'll we'll get going. And, and then Michelle- ask, uh, It's lagging. What? So I think that's my answer. Sound is lagging for me. So I think that was my answer that I, I think there's a bit of delay, but I'm guessing it's just on my end. Okay. Well, hopefully not on everyone's end. I hear you. Okay. Um, and Michelle, if you don't want to kind of hang on once you introduce, you can use those same buttons to stop the video or mute. And I think we can go ahead and get started because I think it's just a, maybe almost, almost 631. We'll just do some intros and then we'll get going. Well, welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm one of the counselors at Oak Street Elementary School. This is my first year at Oak Street, but definitely not my first year in education. Um, I've been doing this for quite some time. And um, one of the things I've always loved about being a counselor is being able to create programs for parents, because I think um, a counselor not only supports students, but supports families. And so in the way beginning of the year, I had sent out a survey to all of the families asking what types of parent programs you would be interested in. And executive functioning skills probably had the, mo the most, if not one of the most, um, uh, was one of the most, if not one of the most uh, sought after topics. And so um, based off of my own scheduling and the school scheduling, it took us a little while to be able to have um, Deborah and Lindsay Come out, but we are so excited they are here and tonight have a lot of wonderful information to share with us. Um, and this is being recorded, so we will, anyone who signed up for it will uh, get a copy of the, um, the presentation tonight. And if you have friends who wanted the presentation, um, didn't sign up, they can just reach out to me or you could just send it to them on your own. Um, in any event, let me go ahead and get started um, and introduce um, Deborah and Lindsay. So um, Deborah and Lindsay are the owners of The Study Pro, an executive function and study skill center in McLean, Virginia. The Study Pro works with students to help them better manage the process of school. This means helping students become better. Oopsies, sorry. <laughs> in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> this means helping students become better planners, time managers, initiators, organizers, and completers of work. Most students aren't taught these skills, yet they are so deeply needed to be successful at school and throughout their careers. And so after today's program, or maybe even at the end of the program, um, I'm sure Debbie and Lindsay will tell you where you can find more information, but um, thestudypro.com is their website. And I highly recommend you check it out because there's lots of good programming, even stuff happening right now for fourth and fifth graders. So with that, I will turn it over to Debbie and Lindsay. Thanks, Michelle. And we hope you can get out of the closet. <laughs> kids right now are like screaming for me. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I was going to say, there's probably three good reasons, all of all of which are excellent reasons you're there. But, and if you wanted to go ahead and you can mute and stop your video, it's completely up to you. But thank you so much for that warm intro, Michelle. And I am very grateful for the opportunity to be here and speak for Oak Hill. I'm grateful that the Wi-Fi just seemed to connect and I was able to rejoin right on time to kind of kick us off here. Um, but as Michelle was saying, yes, Debbie and I here are the proud owners of the Study Pro and 
we do have offerings happening right now. And we do have students right behind my computer here in our homework center doing homework even tonight. So what we're here to talk to you today about, as the title suggests on the screen here, is how executive functions play a role in school success and how they can help us improve our goals and our outcomes in our school success. So before I get started here, real quick, Debbie, I was wondering if I could ask the group to put into the chat just what ages they are here for. So I know we're here and we're speaking to Oak Hill Elementary. However, if you have older students or you have students in middle or high school, if I could just get a quick little gauge, 10 year old, their age or their grade is perfect. Yep. And then what, as you're putting those ages and those grades into the chat, perfect. I just want you to think as we go through some of the strategies today and the scenarios today, five, nine, 13, 16, yeah. So you get a whole range of students in a bunch of different grade levels here. Um, what we're primarily talking about is strategies that might look or sound like they're for elementary schools, but they can be adapted up for students who are older. And we do um, apply them and these skills are needed throughout our entire lives. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat and we'll kind of collect them and we'll answer them as we go if they're a good time to answer. If not, we'll stick around and answer them at the end as well too. So 12, 15, perfect. <laughs> Okay, so before we kind of get into some of the definitions here about executive functions and how they impact our school success, I'm going to give you a couple little case studies here. So if you're looking here at Ethan, you might know Ethan. Yep, my, my child is Ethan. Very bright, capable, is very, very smart, but loves to play soccer. He might lose his stuff. He says he's bored a lot. Ethan might describe school success as a day that they get outdoor recess. If you ask Ethan how their day went, they're like, it was awesome. We got to play outside and today was a beautiful day. So Ethan might have loved today. Now there's the Ethans of the world, but then there also might be other students such as Casey and see if you recognize Casey here. This might be just fine as perfectionist, high achieving, great grades. Teachers are always getting compliments. No problem. Always completes the nightly homework, but has a harder time with some of those longer term assignments. We're studying for a test that might be coming up. Then you might notice this parents that Casey's staying up very late or it's trouble getting to bed early on time or their regular bedtime. Teachers are giving the praise, but you as the parents might be seeing the toll that it might be taking for Casey. And then one more here, if you think about Nora and Nora can't prioritize, will spend maybe an hour thinking about the colors that they want to use on the worksheet and then actually coloring in the worksheet, but hasn't actually answered the questions for what actual content needs to be answered for that homework. They might get frustrated when you try to help them. They have a pretty low frustration tolerance, but they rush through work. They want to get their work done as maybe trouble getting started, but then they miss some details. And then you hear that famous phrase of they're so smart. They just need to put in more effort. So any of these sound familiar, they probably have some similarities. They seem like very different children, but Debbie is going to kind of go through what they actually have in common here. Well, thanks, Lindsay. Um, well, one of the things that we know that they all have in common is that the challenges that Lindsay described, many of them are what we call process challenges. And so we really think of school as kind of the content, which is the math, the history, or the social studies, the English. And a lot of times when kids are obviously struggling with those topics, we find tutors, we give them additional help. But then when we see that things are going across uh, different aspects of school, across the content, you know, when it has to do with how the homework is getting done, how they're managing their emotions around the homework, whether or not they're remembering or forgetting things, that's really what we call the process. And what happens, unfortunately, is that whether it's a teacher or you know another adult in their life or even a parent, you know the view of those children are that maybe they don't care or maybe they're just not motivated. But hopefully by the end of this evening, you'll see that that's not only not true, but it's also not helpful because when we have that approach, then you're not looking for solutions to kind of underdeveloped skills, which is what we're gonna talk about. Um, and we know that parents, especially at this age, are doing great stuff by all kinds of things. We're helping them make lists. We're giving them reminders. We're helping advocate for them. Um, sometimes kids love it. Sometimes kids don't like it. And so, of course, we know that everything we try, um, you know, really 
you know, hopefully is helping and maybe many times kind of keeping them afloat in some ways. But in the end, it kind of may be hurting because what's happening is that they are not having the opportunity to develop those skills. And I hear many of you saying, well, but I would love for them to develop these skills. And if I don't do it, then, you know, how will it get done? And so really what, you know, that's really what we're here to talk about. Um, we're here to talk about what the role is of executive functions in student success. And we won't spend a lot of time defining individual executive functions. We have a lot of information on our website. We have many other webinars. We have um, a quick guide to executive functions, which I'll send a link to um, when we send the replay. But generally what's important to know and become familiar with is that executive functions are a set of mental processes that allow you to make and achieve a goal independently, right? It doesn't mean that you have to do everything on your own, but I'm making the goal and using some of Lindsay's examples to get my homework done, but I get I get like caught up on the coloring in or the highlighting part, or I'm making a goal to get my go to my soccer tonight, but I get caught up because I didn't bring the right materials. And some of the things that catch us up and what we like to call barriers or friction are these eight executive functions that you see on the screen. And there are things obviously like initiation, which we all know what that means, being able to start on something, inhibition, shifting, working memory, um, emotional control, which I always explain is not really being out of control emotionally. It's just that when maybe we see an assignment um, that feels hard to us, you know, we're not as mature in our ability to control our emotions. So maybe we avoid. And a lot of times it's really not that it's just, you know, my initiation is a challenge or my inhibition. Sometimes you know, as we like to say, it's soup. <laughs> you know, it could be many things together. So my materials are a mess and I'm really struggling planning or chunking things up. And so what we really want to do today is to say, regardless of whether this is something that's, you know, pervasive, you know, inside school and out, not only am I having challenges with, you know, some of my executive functions um, and behaviors at school, and again, behaviors aren't meaning I'm bad behavior, it just means how I may be attacking my work or approaching my work. Um, but it may also be, you know, it's tough to get in the shower and then tough to get me out of the shower, you know, or tough to get, as so many of us know, on the phone and off the phone, off of the device. Um, or maybe it's just popping up in specific situations. What we do absolutely know is that, you know, all of these, you know, many of these at least that we, see commonly are a result of an underdeveloped executive function, which to us is an underdeveloped skill. And so the great news and the punchline of all of this is that what we want for kids is to be able to help them to develop those skills in a way that again, they can do that independently. And so what we're gonna go through tonight is hopefully we've already started making that connection between you know, what's an executive function, what is a, a behavior that we see and um, what is the underlying challenge of the executive function. And we also wanna talk about when we help our kids, how can we help our kids kind of in an executive function um, biased way in ways that we're developing, helping them to develop that skill versus doing things for them. And you know, some of it is very challenging because we know that we're our kids' executive functions you know, from the time they're born, you know, we're telling them, and quite reasonably, you know, what they should wear, we're getting them dressed, you know, as, as infants, and then we're telling them what they should wear, where they should go, when they should be on time, what they need to bring. And it is hard as parents, I mean, I have two kids of my own, and I know it's very hard as parents to kind of start to move out of that role. But from a school perspective, it is really critical to help those kids, to help kids build those skills on their own. And especially around planning and starting work, which is where we're gonna emphasize a lot of our discussions tonight. Um, the other thing we know is true is that when st students can't do the work on their own, and when we say the work, it doesn't, again, mean doing the actual math problems. It could be getting into the portal, accessing that, remembering to take that worksheet out of their binder or their backpack, remembering to turn it in. When they're not doing that on their own, they start to feel less than sometimes. And as that, you know, moves into middle school and high school, they do think that they're really the only ones. You know, we have conversations with hundreds and hundreds of parents, I do specifically, 
each um, school year and, and throughout the summer. And we do hear a lot that it is hard on a student when they feel like they need help from everybody to just get through the work. And so what we want to do is to help them feel great about what they're doing and you feel great about how you're helping them as well as what to do and what to say when we're approaching them about homework so that, you know, we are um, preserving the relationship with our, our student. So um, what we of course want, you know, or I guess the question that I would pose and is a rhetorical question is for you to think, you know, what is our goal of school? We all know that, you know, I think we get caught up very much in like, what, how did you do on this quiz? Did you get your homework in? What are your grades? But the truth is those grades are just a marker, a re representation of how well, to be honest, our executive functions are working in many cases, right? How well, not just that we can do the math, but as we get into middle school and beyond, it's how well can we get into the portal? Can we get that, remember to do, you know, to even look into the math, you know, for the portal or history or not wait until the last minute to get that English paper done or that science project done. And so really what we want to do in this whole process of school is to build academic resilience. And what is academic resilience? It's really a student's capacity to persist and thrive despite academic challenges and setbacks. And so what's important to remember is that behavior really never happens without a reason. Behavior is actually language, right? If my, my student or my child is fighting against, you know, starting something, that's saying something, that's saying that, you know, I may not know how to get started. And we'll talk a lot about that tonight. There is a reason the kids are avoiding and I'm asked, you know, we will ask each of you to really think about that the next time we're hearing some kinds of objections. Um, the other thing that's true um, is that avoiding things that are painful, unpleasant, and boring is normal. We do it all the time, right? There are things like taxes that we avoid all the time because they're painful, unpleasant, and boring. And homework is really all of those things in many cases. Now, there are preferred and non-preferred activities. There are things that kids like to do and don't like to do that make it, you know, a situational for them that maybe make it less boring. But honestly, it's not something they want to do when they come home from school. And so the other thing to remember is that when we do things as adults, we do things without maybe thinking about it because we know that there's some kind of a reward. We're not gonna get fired. You know, we know we're hungry, the dinner will be made. You know, whatever those things are, we may not be thinking consciously about it, but the truth is the kids have very limited experience with that. Like, oh, it's gonna feel great when I get that English paper done, right? Or if I worked really hard and stretched myself and it was just super difficult, I'll feel so good about it, you know? And, and that's something that we see develop more into certainly middle and high school. And it's great if we have that type of reflection and self-awareness now, but a lot of kids don't. And their dopamine is not fire for the same reason that ours do as adults. Um, the other you know, phrase I hear a ton and we hear a ton at Study Pro is really, you know, well, you know, I'm very organized and I was an A student and I was this and that, and why aren't they motivated the same way? And these four points came from a webinar called the Science of Motivation um, that I uh, that we are actually hosting here at the Study Pro with Dr. Rebe Rebecca Resnick on April 27th, and we'll share that information. But it really is important to understand that there is a science behind motivation, and so you know we're we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. And so the whole reason we're telling you this that you know if we're having any challenges with school it's most likely based on an underdeveloped skill. And these things like homework are very hard things for kids. And so what is really, what it's really the aim of um, building academic resilience. The aim of building academic resilience isn't really about getting them to do their homework. Hey, honey, have you started yet? What homework do you have? That's not really the goal. Um, if we wanna build academic resilience, we have to build the muscle of basically distress tolerance. <laughs> right? I have to learn as a student to do things that are hard and to push through. And I have to know that things can be hard and, right, that it can be boring and, and that even though it's boring, I can do it. And we want to help them with strategies of how to get that done. And so that's really, you know, um, a lot of what we're going to be focusing on this evening. Yeah. And as Debbie was saying, as we go through this next section, I want you to keep in mind that these eight executive functions that you see here on your screen are developmental. 
So they're developing through their mid 20s. So I don't think I saw any uh, mid 20s, 28, 29, 30 here in the chat of the age of your children. So think and keep in mind that right now it is hard because it's supposed to be hard. This is the time where these skills are developing and the only way they're gonna develop is through times of failure, through times of using them incorrectly, not using them enough. So let's revisit Ethan and Deborah. this is for you. If your child's like Ethan, I'm sure you're not alone. But if we're thinking about Ethan and he's the student that's bored a lot, and I love the Ethans of the world because they're quick-witted and they're really funny and they're really fun to be around, except when it's time to do homework, except when it's time to do something that's not so fun and they need that academic resilience piece. So some of the executive functions, just some that might be at a play when it's time to start homework after school or study might be them shifting from a preferred activity to a non-preferred. So that's using their shifting skill, their flexibility skill, and their inhibition. Can I ignore the distraction? Can I put away the temptation? It can also be that self-monitoring of, hey, we've agreed you're going to start your homework at four o'clock, and I'm not even aware it's 5.30, and I've just been playing Minecraft, and I had every intention to play for five more minutes and then start my homework, but I don't have the self-monitoring yet to be aware of that. And then the emotional control of like, what do I do when I have a very, very valid feeling of this doesn't feel good? I don't want to feel bad. So we're going to walk you through a little scenario here that is very common. And a barrier for a lot of students might be this work is boring. And as Debbie was saying, a lot of adults. I'm sure many of you have had this thought and this feeling of the work is boring. And so we might be drawn to do something fun. Feel free to put in the chat when the work is boring, what do you tell yourself? What do you tell yourself? I'm going to keep going, but if you think of it, when you're like, Ugh, I don't want to do the taxes, but I don't really want to go to jail. I don't want to own owe something later. When you have something boring, we as adults have the frontal lobe and the executive functions to maybe anticipate the reward of doing that. Ethan doesn't have that yet. So what we actually have to do is we have to help them stop this loop, right? Just power through the, that just word to get through the fun stuff. And we might have that experience. But right now, Ethan has the experience of, I have this barrier, this thought of the work is boring, so I'm do something fun. And that feels good. So that reinforces that avoidance. I think we can all relate to that really rush of dopamine. It's really a rush of relief when we do procrastinate on something like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Right? <laughs> when I'll do it tomorrow and suddenly I'll have that motivation, right? I'll be able to read and when it's really done. And what's interesting uh, with Carrie and Jacqueline is that you both really talked about that reward, right? So you kind of promised yourself a reward or you thought about anticipated reward that is really hard for kids to do. And let me, and I'll pause one more thing with you're thinking about Ethan is we, even as parents, we might want to reward the Ethans, but what happens is there's delay, 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 avoidance, 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 and then there's no reward. Now it's, now you got to get ready for bed. We just finished your homework and now it's too late. You got to go to bed. So it doesn't feel like a reward for the Ethans of the world. They don't have that experience yet. But the strategy we can use is one we call reflect and connect, is really reflect on what's going on and connect it to a strategy. Every barrier always has a strategy. So I am not, my goal is not gonna be to convince him to like homework. My goal is gonna say, I'm gonna learn that I can pair it with a strategy. So then all of a sudden that chain of events looks a little bit different. So what we're gonna go through is some strategies and what as we're going through them, I want you to think that if the feeling is I am bored, you really can't punish. Punishment doesn't, you can't punish away a feeling. You can't punish away an emotion. We can punish and we can have consequences for actions. We can punish and can have consequences for behaviors. But is that really treating what the underlying barrier is? And what we're talking about here is he's bored. It is boring. That's valid. So how do we actually strategize around that? So we want to go from this, and then we want to introduce that little stuff, reflect, I need an initiation strategy. This awareness of I need an initiation strategy so that I can then have a different outcome here. So let's get through some of these examples here. Some of the initiation strategies you're going to see are going to be about producing the dopamine when it's not there. Dopamine is the chemical that is about anticipating a reward. It's actually not getting a reward. It's what floods your brain if you're playing at a slot machine. Dopamine is happening and flooding you, and that's why you're able to initiate, you're able to focus, you're able to concentrate when dopamine is present. When dopamine is low, you are not able to do so. 
but dopamine is about the anticipation of a reward. So how do we do that? And how can we use strategies to connect that with homework? So when there isn't any interest, when it's boring, or there isn't any urgency, we can find ways to create it for ourselves. Interest and urgency are two great activators for dopamine and producers of dopamine. So the first might be novelty and interest. Help pairing a preferred with a non-preferred can make it easier to get started. So we have some examples here and what this does, and I want you to remember, this isn't about giving the reward. This is about pairing and helping them be aware that pairing one of these feel good dopamine producers with the act of getting started is what the strategy is. It's not the promise like, oh, do you promise if you do your homework, if I get you the Starbucks? Do you promise? Because I think we've all been in that case. Does it actually happen when they get home? Nope. <laughs> They're like, oh no, suddenly I'll feel better. It's The awareness is the important part. So what we can have them do is reflect and just say, what are some of the strategies that help? Like, grabbing a fidget, keeping their mind occupied, listening to music. I would, there's a great example of how we might not be motivated at all to go to the gym. But if I have the tiger starts coming on, then all of a sudden our motivation is there. So it can change and alter the emotional state that we're in and make it easier to get started. So we're going to go through some specifics here and show you some examples. And music is a great one, but we also might need a cue. So when work is feeling overwhelmed, bring novelty, bring the finish line closer. I love using Alexa and just speak. So it Oops. And when you tell the Ethans of the world, hey, video game soundtracks really help concentration. Why do you think that is? They want you to focus for hours. But the only like kind of caveat there is just not a video game that they play, but that can be a really good rate one to introduce for students to help them get started. Another strategy we might use is sticky notes, highlighters. That was me as a student. Actually, it's, it's probably me still to this day, but you might say, okay, I just had a student in my office here doing math and our goal was to deconfuse the math. I don't even think deconfuse is a word, but that was our goal. I need to deconfuse this math. She pulled it out. And she immediately felt that emotional overwhelm. And I was so proud for her to look straight to my cup and say, I know what'll help. I'm gonna grab the highlighters. The highlighters are a great strategy to isolate the important information, but she knew that what it was actually helping her with is that feeling of overwhelm. And using the highlighter helped her feel like she was taking action. It, and it doesn't hurt that it made it look pretty too. And then keeping the train going here about pretty, <laughs> another great strategy is this is an example, this gift here you see on your screen is when work feels boring and unapproachable, we can change the background color. This is just a Google Doc. It's a built-in feature that Google Docs has that you can go into file and page setup and change the background color. This is a great one. I love doing this with my students and asking them what colors they like. Are they a fluorescent? Do they really like the neon row of colors? As you can see from my example here, I'm more of the pastel row. I'm usually the second row of colors here that helps me just not see that boring white page. And all of a sudden seeing that pastel blue just makes it a little bit easier to get started. It has some novelty and certainly some more interest in choosing the color. And then one more here set of strategies I'm gonna talk about is bringing the finish line closer. If you think about, what the barrier to getting started is. When we're saying it's boring, it's also I'm assuming that it's gonna be boring forever, that it's gonna be boring for the next several hours of my life. So right it's now- It's gonna take so long, <laughs> right? It takes so long. And even if you ask them to estimate it and it's like 15 minutes and they're like, yeah, that felt like forever, <laughs> especially for your elementary school students, their time perception is, it does feel like forever, but what we can do is help them visualize and see the finish line. So that's what exactly what the examples you were giving earlier, Jacqueline and Carrie, like I can power through, get to the fun stuff. I'm able to read. We need to help them with the strategy so they can have the same visualization. So you see some examples here and one of the favorite might be like setting a timer, just see how many we can get done. Let's preview it. Let's get an estimate. How long do you, I'm going to write down an estimate to see how long you, I think it is. You write down an estimate and see how long you think this would take. And then let's compare. And one of my favorites is you see our little hot chocolate mug is, hey, how long, how many problems do you think we could get done while the hot chocolate is heating up? 
or while the popcorn is popping in the microwave. Now, I'm not getting that hot chocolate. I'm not getting that pop popcorn until I've started, until I've gotten some things done. And so that's what's the reinforcing action here. So some other some more specific examples for the finish line and how you can apply it to work, to homework is on the next page here, is this is just a manila folder. It's a manila folder that we've cut into thirds. So I don't know how to start. I'm just going to bring the finish line closer and just open one flap at a time and see these four problems of math at a time. Then I can close that flap, move on to the next, and move on to the next. And so now I'm not seeing that whole page of 12 math problems that I have to do for homework. I'm just seeing the first four. And reducing that visual overwhelm will certainly make it much, much easier to start. And I'll add it. There's some novelty. I once asked, did this with a student. He said, are you going to patent this and start selling it? I'm like, I don't think I can patent just cutting a manila folder in thirds. I want every parent to just do that because it's a really great strategy to help especially elementary school age kids get started on their homework. And Lindsay, just to, to kind of pause and, and do a little kind of check in in terms of, you know, what we've been saying all along, we've been saying that the common school problems are that a lot of times when we do see resistance, it is the language and saying, you know, hey, I just don't know how to get started, or I think this is going to be too hard or whatever. And, you know, even if we're avoiding work, it's also language. And so, you know, a lot of what Lindsay's going through and what we've gone through so far is, hey, how do we make it novel? How do we bring the finish line closer? I know that my son who's graduating college in a month, yay, um, you know, we would fight for 20 minutes before we did something that might take five. We would fight for an hour if it was gonna take two. And it was always about getting started. And so there are definitely challenges that we have with kids, especially as we're moving to longer term assignments. And these are really great strategies for us to be able to, again, one of the goals of this evening, help our kids not by asking them where they are in the process, by, by almost like sitting next to them and making it fun for them. My ninth grader now allows me to work with her on things that are challenging because I'm not doing the work with her, but I'm helping her with a lot of strategies that make it easier. Like we're changing the color of things or we're like connecting with the question or we're doing things that make it easier. So, you know, just to pause in, in what we're doing to say, this is really why we're sharing all this with you. And Jacqueline, I saw your comment about digital and there is ways to do it digitally. The two favorite ways that I like to do it digitally is one, zooming in. Just zooming in and seeing one problem at a time helps reduce the visual. But if it's a doc, just inserting a square that's filled in with gray. And it does the exact same thing. So it does, I can cover up the entire bottom half of that Google Doc and I'm just focusing it one at a time and I'm moving it down as I go. And even with the college students, we, we use a strategy that we call owning the document that when you can, make a copy of it, change the font, make it more accessible to you and with a college student recently, we opened up a doc. It was scary and overwhelming. And she just heard me go, oh gosh. And she goes, I know, make a copy, own it, zoom in. And I was like, love it. Yes. She's now known her own initiation strategies when you're ever feeling it. But this next one is also for when it might be online or it might be a physical piece of paper, but if you can use a whiteboard and anything that's plastic can be a whiteboard at home, but I'm not feeling motivated. I'm going to bring that finish line closer by writing down how many problems I have to do and erasing them as I go. So I get to see them go away. <laughs> it's basically, I get to see number one, go away, two, go away, three, go away. And I get to visualize the reward of being done. Another alternative that we've done before is um, counting up post-it notes, literally counting up, okay, how many problems do you have to do? You have to do 10. I'm going to count out 10 post-it notes. After each one, you get to crumble it up and throw it away. There was one time that the promise was you get to crumble it up and like throw it at Lindsay. <laughs> but it was a really good motivator to just make it more fun and novel, but also it just helped them visualize this is not going to last forever. It's going to be when those 10 post-it notes are in the trash or it's going to be when that whiteboard is clean. It's not going to be forever. One more comment. You know, when we, when um, my daughter and her good friend were um, at the study pro and they were in elementary school, you know, just to note that, of course, the problems don't have to be in order, and Lindsay might have already mentioned that. So one of the things that's kind of fun is, like, this young lady was just absolutely committed to do none of her math, period, the end. It was not going to happen. She was going to do it at home. And I was like, really? I said, you know, 
how about, you know, if you could just do one, if you would do one, what's the easiest one that you could do, right? Because we, you know, it's really like getting on the treadmill. Sometimes it's just about starting. And then we, you know, created this whiteboard with all the different numbers. I said, well, I'm going to put all kinds of numbers and mix it up and see if I can trick you and, you know, see if we can actually get those done. And I was in a conference room um, later and she came and showed me, you know, the whole thing. Oh my God, look, see, I got them. And she had done every single problem. So this stuff really does work. <laughs> And, and another one that kind of works with the same idea. Oops, did I go too far? Yeah. Oops, little bit, sorry. But that's all right. Um, is just basically when we're saying, like, have a visual timer. Like, we say set a timer for five minutes, and it might feel to us like we know what five minutes is. I know I can look up at the clock, my digital clock, and know what five minutes is. But using a time timer and a visual timer like this one really, really helps them see it get closer to the break. And you see it came, comes with a little whiteboard, little plaque there that you can stick on there and help them visualize when the break is. I'm going to do problems one, two, three, four, and five, and then my break's at 530, and I can set that timer. And then they can start doing that for themselves. And again, it creates some novelty and it creates some urgency that helps them get started. Exactly. The time timer, couldn't live without it, I will say. So then this path comes to not reinforcing the avoidance, but now this one replacement thought, I need an initiation strategy. The action might be, I can chunk my work, I can set a timer, and now I've earned something fun to do. So now I'm actually reinforcing the use of a skill. I'm reinforcing the use of a strategy and that self-awareness that actually helps them become more independent and leads to that success that we're looking for here. So, but what happens here in the takeaway is there are going to be times that the student might not always say the work is boring. We might hear different things and there might be resistance to trying strategies, especially at this age. So Debbie's going to go through some kind of scenarios that I'm sure are going to sound pretty familiar to some of you at home. So how many of you, go ahead and share if you've heard the, ugh, I'm bored. And as Debbie pulls up some other examples, I'm sure are going to ring true as well. So again, you know, the reason why we put these examples up is because we often hear hear a lot of what you see, right? I really don't have anything to do. I did it just five more minutes on my device, whatever, right? And the truth of the matter is that all of these are really saying very much of the same thing, but they're which is, you know, there is some barrier for them to get started. And it may be again the initiation, it may be the inhibition that I really want to be on my device. Um, it may be that they don't know how to get started, but the truth is that they're never really going to tell you very often. They don't tell you specifically what's the need behind that behavior as we call it. And it is true that if they feel they don't understand the material, they may feel overwhelmed. They may feel their efforts, um, don't really make a difference. And so why should they even, why should they even try? Um, and is, you know, Lindsay talked a lot about dopamine levels. That is very real. I mean, we have this, all of us, we all sometimes just need a break or we're just like, oh, I just can't get myself to do it. And so, you know, we, there are some other things we could do, jumping jacks, running, you know, chase the dog, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I force myself to take breaks because I bring my dog to work <laughs> and I have to then bring her home before the kids get into the study bro. So, you know, I do that because otherwise I'll be working from eight in the morning to whatever. And I really know that science says, you know, when the kids, when we all take breaks, that we get more done, we're more efficient. So it really is helpful to replenish those dopamine levels. And we like to say our kind of executive function fuel tanks um, to, to take breaks and to use some of these strategies. And the other thing that we really wanted to share, and we, you know, hinted at this earlier, is that our role as adults are to be that calm presence for the kids. That when you hear a lot of this stuff, you're going to be, you know, getting agitated often. But being that, you know, steady, calm presence is what we really want to be. And we don't want to try to convince them, well, it won't take, it only take five minutes, only take, you know, 10 minutes. You really just need to get going. Why, you know, all that. But what we want to do is to be curious. And so you may wonder, like, how do I do that? And that's really what we want to uh, take you through now. So Lindsay's going to share, you know, the kind of four-step process that we advocate to being curious and using that example um, for how to put it in practice in your home. 
So as Debbie was saying, since they do not have the ability yet to say, hey, my dopamines are really low, my dopamine levels are really low, and I'm having trouble getting started, instead you're going to hear, oh, I'll do it later. It's not that much. I'll do it after dinner. Now, this four-step process is specifically about homework, but it you can be used at any time, any place where you might get some pushback from your students. And the first step is, is set the boundary. You as the parent, of course, have the role and the responsibility to set the boundary and then expectation for the student. But the second step is then to validate. Validate, it is hard. This is hard because it is hard. It feels hard, it is hard. And then the third step is that really pivotal one. Be curious and collaborate. So the curious is about teaming up with your student. So when you try to convince them, as many of you have experienced, they're just gonna try to convince you harder. So we don't wanna try to convince, we try wanna be curious. And then the last step here is the invitation to the on-ramp, invitation to using the strategy. So how that might look and how that might sound is, two things can be true. Screen time is over and it's time to start your homework. That is the boundary that all of us hope to enforce when it's time for them to start their homework. Then the validation might sound like, I get it right? It makes sense. It's not as interesting. It makes it hard to shift. So what I might wonder here, so my next step and my questioning is, I wonder if there's anything that can make it easier to get started. Any ideas, right? So I know, and this is where you can use your same example. I know I find it easier to get started when I have my cup of coffee in the morning. What's your favorite drink? That's another way to be curious. But then this, the last and the final step actually helps them learn the strategy is, Okay, let's write the problems one on time on a whiteboard, and then you can race them as you finish, is the one we were talking about. And that invitation to on-ramp, this is the four-path solution to actually avoid the fights, the resistance, the pushback at home, and the exhausting efforts that come from trying to convince your kids it's trying to start homework. And the other thing that's really critical, and of course, Lindsay um, says this all the time as well, is that you know, we want to share, we don't want to keep this a secret with our, to our, with our students. We want to share with our students that we are using a strategy. The words barrier, the words friction, the words executive function, the words strategy, those should be words in your home. And, you know, again, a personal story is that when my daughter got in my car and, you know, maybe she was in sixth or seventh grade and she said, mom, you know, I used a strategy today. I thought, wow, okay, that means we, we've been successful. Because what do we want for our kids? We know we want academic resilience, but what does that mean? That means that when they see a barrier, they know that they can use a strategy, that they have the ability to overcome those obstacles. It is everything we want for them in life, you know, and it is the same thing in school. It's building that muscle of tolerance, of getting over, you know, things that are hard and obstacles that are in the way. So we want to share with them, as Lindsay said, you know, hey, let's write the problems because that's a strategy. I know that has worked for you in the past, or that's a strategy that really works for me. And we know that when we when things are hard, we want to use a strategy, right? So there's nothing wrong with sharing that. We want to share that with them. Mm -hmm. So and so thinking about back to Casey. So Casey was our student who was our perfection six student who really did well in school, who always did their nightly homework. However, what we see here is some similar executive functions at play when it comes to long-term assignments. So they can really do their nightly homework, but there's a lot of emotional control because of the long-term assignment is going to be worth a big part of their grade. So I painfully am aware that I have this upcoming assignment, but I might not be able to get started right? I might have trouble using my working memory and knowing what to do. So what that might look like here as Debbie goes through is, I don't need a plan. They know the due date, right? Right. I don't need a plan. And so as we went through last time, that there's a barrier and what do they do naturally? They rely on their working memory. What does that mean? I'm going to just remember everything that I need to do. We know that either our parents, if parents are reminding the kids all the time, or they're just winging it, that is not a long-term strategy. That is not something that's going to work. And what they need is a planning strategy. And so we're going to talk about something called to do versus when do. And the, the key point here that we would like for you to remember, if you remember nothing else <laughs> about planning, is number one, a list is not a plan. Um, a list is a list of stuff. A list can get very long. A list can be overwhelming. A list does not have due dates necessarily, or even if it does, it doesn't have what you're going to do and the order you're going to do it. And we really need both. And as we get into middle school and certainly into high school, 
um, we cannot just rely on winging it anymore. And so it's the key to self-awareness. It's the key to initiation. It's the key to independence. And if we are ever stressed about something and we have a big project at work or we have a huge dinner party or whatever it is, if we don't have a plan, you know, once we have a plan, it's easier for us to get going. It's easier for us to reduce our stress. And so what we're going to go through is this strategy called um, when do versus to do. And, and what we want to do is to make sure that um, we start to shift our planning with this premise in mind that just knowing the due date. So I have this worksheet, it's due tomorrow, it's due in two days. I have the science that's due in, you know, project that's due on uh, April 25th. And that's not enough. Okay. So that's just when you have to submit it. But what we want to do also is to understand what the to do's are and be able to schedule those to do's um, over time based on what our personal challenge or personal uh, calendar looks like. And so planning is really a combination of to do and when do and when you have to submit it. And so Lindsay will go through that a bit more. So if we're thinking about Casey, this is Casey's son's fair project assignment sheet. She got it from her teacher. She knows it's due in a couple of weeks and I have emotional overwhelm. I don't like that feeling. So I'm going to avoid, I have plenty of time to do this. Now, the first step in the part of the strategy here is a chunk it strategy. And we have this little anagram that stands for check the due date and highlight the important information. And then what you're doing is taking this big overwhelming assignment sheet and you are coming up with your to do's. But as Debbie was saying, a list is not a plan. So this is a list of to-dos, but how do we translate that into a plan? So what that looks like is we might have our couple weeks leading up to when this is going to be due. And we start by putting the due date. We do need to know that. We need to know when it is actually needs to be submitted. And then we're going to add in some of these conflicts, these unmovable things. Also, start with the stuff that's important to them. Oh, you have a long weekend. Let's you have a planned sleep over that weekend. I don't know if the science project, we're going to spend too much time on that long weekend on the science project. So what if we blocked those off? On the nights you have soccer, it's really hard to get started. On nights you have soccer, we might have to prioritize other homework those nights. So if we move and we block out those conflict days, then we're left with the days that we can fit in our to-dos. And then it helps her actually see and visualize that that finish line and how I can take that big overwhelming list of to-dos and translate that into an actionable plan. Then it's much easier to get started. Especially at this age, there might be a lot of barriers to making a plan because I'm gonna remember it all. So another way to do this same strategy, but digitally is using Google Keep, which is just a scene there on the right side in the green. It's just a digital checklist. So I have my plan and then it's always there when you need it. So when I'm actually creating my slides for this actual science project, I'm able to self-monitor and check off and see the finish line get closer. This is a great tool. I love doing it. They love the novelty of creating it right there. And then another one is keeping in mind, being flexible. A lot of times when kids see a long-term plan and they have trouble initiating, they feel like they're signing a contract that they're always going to be able to initiate and do that. So a Kanban board is basically this three columns that they can put their chunks, they can put their to-dos on sticky notes and just move one over a day. Then I'm not making a commitment for what those next three weeks of my life are going to look like. I can say as an adult with a frontal lobe that's fully developed here that I don't know what tomorrow necessarily is going to look like. So my plan needs to be flexible. So this is a great one that for kids who are very resistant to writing out in a planner or on a calendar that adds some flexibility and novelty, put it right there up on the wall. You just pick one of your chunks a day and we're going to move closer and closer to that finish line. And then our last little example here for Nora is the student with nightly homework. So what about Nora who might have trouble initiating and missing some assignment directions, getting started for a plan for their nightly homework, even if right now they only have half an hour of homework, even if it might be shorter, Bert's making a plan helps develop the skills now so they can execute it in the future as well. So as Lindsay said, um, what she was just reviewing was when we have a science project or something that is more than just what's due tomorrow or the next couple of days, but it's really that something that needs to be chunked and to be thought, you know, thoughtful in terms of how we're planning it over a week or a couple of weeks or a month. Um, and now really want to kind of turn to nightly planning. And again, it's really critical 
to do both and to start even today, you know, I would say as early as, you know, even fourth grade, you know, looking, it could be earlier depending on how much homework is done or if there's any homework or even just planning out what, what does a week look like in your house in terms of, you know, extracurricular activities and things like that. But it's giving these kids a sense of like time and to transfer responsibility from the parent to the child to let them, do you want to use color pencils? Do you want to use crayons? Do you want to use, what do you want to do to help to make your plan? And, you know, to give a sense of like, you know, what days of the week certain um, uh, sports are on and other things so that they can under identify what their personal conflicts might be. So we know that, you know, as kids get more work, that they don't consistently remember their work. They obviously sometimes rush through, as it says, um, or feel overwhelmed. And so what we want to do is to take all that out of their brain and not have them do two things, have to remember everything, but also to have to reinitiate and reinitiate to go back into the portal. Oh, I did my math. I did my preferred stuff, what I wanted to come home or the stuff I remembered, but maybe, you know, then I'm tired and I don't feel like doing anymore, but I don't, I don't really, I want to avoid going back in the portal or going back into my agenda book or going wherever I keep my homework and, and creating that strategy. And so what we, uh, I mean, and figuring out what else I have to do, I'm sorry. And so what we really want to do is just to identify what assignments are about how long they think it's going to take for them to do it and then prioritize those. And we have a pri we have a prioritization approach, which I alluded to earlier, which is easy, hard. So it's the idea that, hey, you know what? I want to start with something that's um, a easier because I want to warm my brain up and I am transitioning from something that I might that might have been preferred. And so maybe it's just writing an email to my teacher or doing something that's coloring in a map or just a math worksheet that might be easier for me. But it's all personal to what that student really, you know, to each of your individual students. And then I move to the hardest and the highest priority because at that point my brain's awake and I'm the most awake that I'm gonna be <laughs> of the rest of the evening. And then I go back to something easy. And we also want to track the actual time spent, not because we're trying to do a gotcha, but because we the, the only way that kids can learn time is to actually practice, right? You wouldn't tell them that they should be great on their soccer team and not practice, right? We want them to be great you know, time managers, but we don't have a way of practicing time with them. And so this is a way to start practicing time when the stakes are really low, so that when, you know, that big English paper is due as the days go by in middle school, you know, they don't think, oh, it's going to take five minutes or it's going to take five hours. We start to build evidence that things will really only take about 20 minutes or really only take about 10 minutes. And, you know, again, that calm presence, no judgment, that's really what we want to, to be. You know, another way, again, we always love our visual strategies. So another way of, of doing this is, you know, hey, again, it's kind of a combination of a planning and initiation strategy. You know, hey, this is my science homework and let's look and see what we want to get done. Um, and, you know, so let's just put that a little bit like a, almost like a Kanban board, but, you know, just to help them prioritize in what order and steps they're gonna do something. And Debbie, what I'll draw your attention to real quick is this was one assignment that needed to have three different steps. So think about the student who, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it, I just have to do my science homework. It's going to take 10 minutes. However, you can see the details in there, including the one that's often missed. Oh, I needed to email my science teacher when it's done. That was a specific assignment direction that could be so easily overlooked, especially if I love the finish line and feeling, oh, done, close that laptop. I'm done for the night. I can go back on Minecraft. By having that little visual reminder and having that actual cue that's saying, hey, making my plan is knowing what actual done looks like. And that meant emailing a teacher in this case. And that's the perfect segue to there's a strategy called get ready, do and done. And this may look a little complex, but it's not. The real key takeaway here is that we want kids to start visualizing what does it look like when something's done? And in this case, this was a biography that they need to read. And so we say, okay, what does it look like when it's done? You know, this is the actual um, rubric here that, you know, the, the, the teacher is using and there's a paper and it's gonna have these elements and this is just a whiteboard they put it on. And then we ask our students, so what do we have to do to get ready in order to 
you know, if we're going to try to aim for this goal, because now we can visualize what done looks like. Oh, I need the book. I need to have my laptop. You know, I need the directions with the worksheets, right? I need some pencils or, you know, if I'm going to use my laptop, I don't need that. But, but, you know, and then what are the steps that I need to do? And again, we're chunking it up. It's not something that you have to do always on this whiteboard. It's something you can do in, you know, um, put layout two middle of folders. You know, you really can just visually, I mean, verbally ask, you know, what is done look like? Let's, let's take a look at the directions. Because the first thing we always want to do with kids, unless it's, you know, very obvious or evident, like do these five problems is read the directions. And that's the first thing you want, because that's also an initiation strategy. And what I'll and say, so, oh. like a little hack, I love it. If you just have a plain piece of paper and put it in a sheet protector, you got a whiteboard that you can do that, get ready, do and done and reuse it on different needs, different nights, and it, just erase it. So you build in some novelty and the planning skill there. And, you know, I think you get a pick, uh, an understanding of this. I know that we're um, running to the bottom of the hour, but the idea is, of course, that you insert the strategy and you have a better outcome and it does reinforce the resilience and not the kind of pattern of avoidance. Yeah. Um, so, Lindsay, do you want to go through these real quick? Yes, I was alluding a little bit earlier that, especially at this age, when I only have a half an hour of homework, 20 minutes of homework, it might that we're hearing a lot of these objections. Now, a lot of kids, and I can even, as an executive function coach, I could try to justify it. I feel like, yeah, it does take a little bit of time and they only have one thing. However, it was by practicing and building the skill, they'll be able to do it later. Now, a lot of these, especially these, we would want to actually respond to. Like, I don't see the point. And we try to convince here, but what they're really saying is I want to get started right away. I don't want to lose momentum. I don't want to lose my motivation. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get started if I slow down. So again, the reminder here is we really don't want to convince. We want to be curious. So how it might sound using that four-step process here is basically that, hey, we want to develop that skill. So on school nights, we're going to make a plan. We're going to make a plan for that current and upcoming work and that's still setting that boundary and setting that expectation, but then we can validate. I get it. Like I understand. So what it might sound like when we validate is, Hey, I get it. It's boring. It feels like it's not necessary yet. So if you click through, then it can feel frustrating. And so how long might you estimate it take to make a plan? How long do you think it's going to take to go through your assignments and see what you have to do either tonight or that's upcoming and then help them on ramp and use a strategy here is let's set a timer for that 15 minutes and then giving them that choice. Do you want to make that plan tonight on the homework plan that you saw earlier? Or do you want to use a post-it note tonight? And then all of a sudden they're on ramped and initiated into that assignment and they're reinforcing the use of the planning skill and you're not locked in the convincing argument conversation. So we've kind of gone through a lot tonight, but we hopefully will, sh you know, we'll walk away really with three key thoughts. One is that we don't want to hide from our st our students, from our kids, that strategies are what we want to build. And those executive function skills are developmental. And so when we, kn and we know that throughout the course of our academic career, we are in our life, we're going to hit barriers. And so we want them to really know that there are strategies out there that help them build those executive functions and help them overcome the barriers. And then of course, we as parents know that turns into academic resilience. And so it really is about building tolerance to push through those things that are hard. And then the best way we can help is being that calm presence where we're not you know, worrying about the outcomes, especially at this stage in the game, but we're worried about the process. If you, we're putting our, our effort into the process that says, you know, hey, what is what hard about homework? Because as Lisa Demora said, who's a you know New York Times bestselling author, you know we only have a few chances, and if we continue to step in it, was her words um, from last night, you know the kids won't keep coming to us, and we want the kids to be able to come to us because we do want to be able to help them when they need their work chunked, um, or if they don't understand the questions. And so um, we're just going to run through some free things that we're doing that we might be interested in. And again, we'll send this out afterwards. Um, oh, whoops, looks like the um, presentation, huh, sorry. The picture somehow didn't show up here. Um, 
but we do have a growth mindset for writing workshop. Sorry that the picture didn't show. And that is happening on April 29th, um, which is a Saturday. And if you want to, um, we'll send the links out in, in the um, replay, with the replay. But you can certainly uh, use this QR code. It's fourth and fifth grades. And it's really about, you know, what happens when we get stuck in writing, using a lot of strategies very specific to writing. Um, uh, we also have, this is for high school, and I know many of you don't have high schoolers, but if you do, or have friends that have high schoolers, um, we have a free workshop this Saturday for how to get unstuck and write. And then um, we also have a class that um, is a growth strategies class. We will start, we have another one starting on Tuesday, but it's also run all summer. And so it's what are the, what is the mindset and the organization um, that we need and the academic skills that we need, the study skills we need to be successful in middle school. And so that is for rising fourth and fifth graders um, and information's on our website. And we do a bunch of stuff over the summer, um, including math coaching to help with those math packets, um, parent coaching to talk about executive function skills and everything from like, if we do have testing on your kids, you know, how to translate that into next steps. And then, you know, executive function or academic resilience coaching and writing coaching. So um, that really is it for us, but we do want to, you know, certainly we'll share, say, I know Michelle, you may be on, um, we'll stay and answer any questions that people have. Um, and her kids might've got her. They might've busted down through the closet yeah. door. <laughs> got her. I remember the old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the bath bathtub and <laughs> oh I don't know if you're still on mute oh I can't hear you no oh okay there's a mute it should be a mute but oh, there we go <laughs> I'm still here. Nope. My kids did not get me. I think my husband <laughs> found them <laughs> banging outside my door. Um, thank you guys so much. So helpful. I know just in my job as a counselor, I've run this year more executive functioning groups than I have done any other year. And so um, this, the, the strategies you provided today are incredibly helpful. I will start even using those in my small sessions with kids. Um, so thank you so much for your time and um, to everyone out there, you know, I encourage you check out the stuff that's happening at Study Pro. Um, these are two fantastic people with a wealth of information. And so even if you can't convince your kids to go, you can get parent coaching so that you yourself can figure out how to work with your kid and eventually. Maybe <laughs> so again, thank you both so, so much. Um, I really appreciate it. And to everyone, have a good evening. Yes, and Francesco, because we didn't have a chance to answer the question. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to email us at info at thestudypro.com, info at thestudypro.com. We're happy to answer any questions and set up a call. So sorry about that. We didn't get to answer questions, but we really appreciate being here. And thanks to everybody for being here. Bye.